Should have come better dressed for this crowd. You like you like this accent better? Is this more appropriate for instance? Can we turn the lights down? I will tell you a story. Years ago, I won't use this accent the whole time. It's, it's, it takes a lot of energy. You have to really think harder about what you say, which probably would be a good idea if I'm going to be talking. It's being recorded, but. Um, uh, a, a few years ago, I was invited to go to uh, Romania, and I was I, I landed in the city called Cluj, which, if you're familiar with with Central European geography, is the capital of Transylvania. And the reason that's significant was it was October, and I left America when it was in the height of decorating for. Halloween, and so everything was Halloween decorations, and I am now in Transylvania, and I have vampire on the mind, and so I'm in a van with a group of people, and the Romanians from different provinces and whatnot, we're driving through this town, and I, I see this little teeny Eastern European car, either a Dacia or a Trabant, I'm, I'm not up on, on my automotives from that region, but little teeny car, and it had a blanket on top and then tied on with a piece of rope going through the windows was a coffin. And I thought to myself, that is the most awesome Halloween stunt that I have ever seen. And I need to get a picture of this, being that I was kind of also channeling the ugly American tourist uh, for the group. And uh, so I step out of the car because we're stuck in traffic. And, um, and I took a picture and immediately there was these loud voices and they were not happy voices and we realized that there was a funeral procession and there really was somebody in that coffin it was not Halloween and I took a picture of their trying to get grandma either to the church or somewhere but um, anyhow they didn't like it very much they started cussing us out and then the bottle started to fly and that was when the driver got the car up on the sidewalk and uh, we got out of there um, what that has to do with what we're talking about, I haven't a clue, but they say in sp making speeches you should have a warm-up. <laughs> and That was a kind of cold warm-up, or at least room temperature, I don't know. Um, so anyhow, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Father George Aquaro. I'm the pastor of St. Matthew Antiochian Orthodox Church in Torrance, California. And I'm going to turn my cell phone off so I don't interrupt myself. Um, I wish I'd get people in church to do that reliably. Um, it's always fun when you're doing something very solemn and all of a sudden... Doo, 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 doo. Um, in fact, we were at a restaurant and my phone went off and there's these bells going off. And I said, you know, why does your phone... You know, oh, that's a really nice ringtone. And I said, yeah, it's, it's good when you have a phone and you're, you're in church. You know, if it rings, it kind of goes with the ambiance, you know. So, um, anyhow, so I am a, a priest in the Patriarchate of Antioch. Um, that is the, um, when you talk about the Orthodox Church, when you talk about East and West, um, I think one of the fundamental difference between East and West is that in the Western system, you kind of have the whole notion of a single entity, uh, church headed by a single person pope um, in the orthodox church it's we're actually a collective sisterhood associate uh, of various local regional churches and of which Antioch is one of the five ancient sees um, and today because Antioch is largely uh, just a kind of a wreck it was destroyed by an earthquake sometime in the middle ages and our synod now meets in um, Damascus, Syria. So all of the Middle Eastern Christians, that's us. Uh, we go as far as Baghdad and, and you know the Persian border, down through the Gulf, into the Levant. Um, and then, of course, as in the modern era, we're just 
all the uh, uh, all the other places that are kind of like the new lands. I'm going to take my hat off because it's warm in here, and I came dressed for winter. Um, so um, I received my training at uh, uh, through the uh, my archdiocese. I also went to seminary. I got an MDiv. Uh, and uh, since that time, I've been working uh, as a first as a deacon and then as a priest. Um, I've done some studies um, on this topic. I've attended a few actually Roman Catholic trainings because um, I don't believe in organized religion. I'm Orthodox. We don't have like the Roman Catholics are very organized with how they do things. Um, the Orthodox, it's we're we're kind of a little bit more laid back, I would say, on on the whole organizational thing. Uh, you're lucky that I showed up on time. Um, there's, and, and it kind of goes further because, like, for example, um, when you talk about the Roman Catholic Church in the West, they have these very specific offices. For example, there's an office of an exorcist. And um, it's actually a very ancient office. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's, it's um, in the canons, it's it's mentioned very early that there were these various offices within the in the church, and then it seems like you know very early on a lot of that stuff they just said you priests were paying you enough, the least you could do is earn your pay by doing some of these other jobs, and so all those specific offices kind of disappeared, and we're we're kind of the guys that do everything. Um, so um, there isn't an office of exorcist per se. We don't have a a formal title like in the West. For example, the Catholic Church, every diocese is by canon law supposed to have a, an office of an, an, an actual in-house exorcist. And um, my introduction to the topic was um, far less uh, formal. Um, it, it largely, cons it, it largely it, it is a, the you, you get one of these books because you spend money and you buy a book and the book says, uh, you know, here's the exorcism section and if you have need of it, you just kind of do it and if it gets, if it's a really big bun, it's kind of a good idea to call your bishop. So again, not really organized. Um, my start in this came um, with, um, well, first I should probably warn you that, that um, I was not raised um, as a Christian, so I was actually raised in a household where um, there was a lot of occult stuff going on, and then I got my chance to get initiated and did that kind of stuff, and then I left all of that and uh, can't, became a Christian and was very happy to get away from it because it was making my life miserable. And um, so for many years, I kind of avoided all of this kind of stuff. And, um, and then one day, I was assigned to a new parish and... Um, I was actually doing some construction work because my, you know, people deal with stress in various different ways. My way of dealing with stress is power tools. I play with power tools. Um, and so I decided to put the power tools to good use and I was doing some demolition in the church. And I'm in the church and I hear um, footsteps walking on the other side of a set of doors that lead into the main church. I'm kind of in the narthex in the front area. And I keep opening the door saying, hello, um, and there's nobody there. And it's not just like the, you know, the, the Bob Marley, or uh, Jacob Marley, you know, the chains and any of that kind of stuff. I uh, said, so Bob Marley, it's... Um, <laughs> I, I have to remind people that my, my lower education was LA Unified School District, so all of our grammar books were scratch and sniff. You know? <laughs> That smells like a vowel. Um, so I'm very, I still have to take a shoe off to count to 11, which is kind of embarrassing when you're uh, at the store. And, you know, you have to do high math. You have to ask one of my kids, you know, what does that add up to? Um, so that's, that's my challenge. But um, so anyhow, so I'm, I'm hearing these, it, it, the sound of, of footsteps and, and and fabric, uh, like like pant legs, and I'm hearing somebody like walking back and forth in front of these doors, and 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 this is happening in the middle of the day, and I, I, I'm really puzzled, and I'm wondering that if maybe that there's something wrong with me, and and I'm trying to think of maybe it's sound is being carried from out in the street, but so I learned that when I start hearing the sound, that I run out in the street to like catch whoever's outside the front door. 
of the church and there's nobody there. And I go back inside and there's nobody there. And so um, one of the things that um, when you when you are um, when you are someone who is 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 um, mentally challenged as I am. Uh, you learn very quickly that if you want to survive in this world, that when you when you get a bright idea, you should check it out with three or four people, uh, preferably those who haven't been uh, who, who've demonstrated some kind of responsibility in life and aren't on parole or um, just getting out of the hospital from a really cool accident. So I, I said, you know, I'm hearing these things. I should ask some other people. So I go to these other people who work in the church. I said, have you noticed anything strange in the church? And no. Great. Okay, it's me. It's me. So I'm in the doing demolition. I hear the walking and forth, and I just said, you know, if this goes on, I'm going to have to look at getting medication or something because I'm, I'm getting audio hallucinations. I uh, went on WebMD. Um, and, uh, and a few days later, someone who works in the church um, comes running up to me and says, there's somebody walking around in the back of the church, and I can't see him. And, uh, is that what you were talking about? No. Bingo. Okay, now there's two of us. Within a couple of days, there's a few other people who began to hear this, um, these sounds. So you get this, uh, that, uh, and, and of course now I'm also, you have to remember, is I'm in a, a church where um, probably about half of the community are, are, are Middle Eastern Christians. They're from the Middle East, and they're much more, they're, they're not from kind of white middle class America that, doesn't believe in these kind of spiritual things, right? These are people who have uh, experiences, you know, and they're fully willing to acknowledge that there's a spiritual world and everything else, and they also acknowledge that they want no part of it if they can help it. And so you don't want people knowing that there's a ghost in your church, okay, or whatever it is, right? So, um, so it's like, we need, to, we need to deal with this quietly. And so I... I quietly call my bishop, and my bishop says, I don't know, look into it. So you were talking about that official uh, imprimatur authorization. You get the letter and, da, 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 and make you an exorcist and this and that. I didn't get anything like that. I basically got, well, figure it out. Bye, you know, click. And so then I called the seminary, and, and, and you would figure that in the seminary, um, they would have this kind of stuff, but remember is that, you know, like seminaries, is, there's sort of like an arms race, the US, USSR with nuclear missiles, with them it's academics, and this kind of stuff isn't popular with academic people. Um, this is kind of like the inconvenient thing. This is, uh, you know, so it was like, they were they were really not interested, and so I called around, and meanwhile I said, okay, well, I'm gonna get the book out, and what do I do when my floorboards creak? And I went in the index, and it didn't say anything. And that really bummed me out. And I went in the front of the book, and the front of the book didn't say anything either. And I said, so what, what am I going to do? And, um, and don't buy one of these. Um, so... Um, I, I, I started doing the exorcism prayers, and I'm throwing holy water around, and I'm, and I'm driving out whatever this demon is, because it's got to be a demon that's, like, causing this kind of... And nothing changed. And so finally I got a hold of an old abbess. I shouldn't call her old. She might be watching this. Um, but the abbess of, of one of our local monasteries, and she goes, oh, yeah, that happened in a... a, a a church I was in years ago, and here's what you do. You do a, a service for commemorating uh, the departed, and you pray for them, and it'll stop. I said, really? I said, yeah, it's that simple. So I went, and I got, grabbed one of the other guys who was, who was witnessed all the stuff, and we did the service. And um, in most of this work, when you're doing things, like, for example, when, when I did the house blessing for your friends, um, anything special happen? very quiet 99% um, of 99% of these kind of things when you go actually go and do it there's nothing that happens you kind of wonder if you're like wasting your time and then you get you know that you get the feedback is which the best feedback is they don't call you back 
which means everything's fine. They 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 they, they hit the jackpot. They got their they got their stuff from Vegas. They drove home. Um, uh, so, but in this case, it was a little different. Um, meanwhile, I had made contact with uh, Adam Bly, who is a, a layman in the, in the Roman Catholic Church, and he deals with kind of de deals with training Roman Catholic priests in, in exorcism and all that. We were talking about you know these different types of apparitions and all that. But I do that. We did the service, and during the service, as we would uh, chant certain parts of the service. Uh, whatever was there was was knocking responses so we'd say amen and you hear and we said another part of amen and it wasn't happening at any other time so it wasn't like there was just a loose floorboard because um the one thing i will tell you about this whole topic is how many of you are skeptical about kind of spiritual like ghosts and demons and uh, it's kind of like you know that was all back then but any skeptics here it's good to be skeptical it's good to like when you walk into a situation and say, "Is this is this me or is this them? Is this?" I had um, a, a, some time back a lady. The whole family say, "Oh, she's being terrorized by a demon." And I went and I kind of did whatever little tests I could do, and and it was just nothing was coming back. In fact, at one point, um, she said, "Oh, the demon's here and it's really terrorizing me." I said, "Okay, I'm going to use one of my special prayers." And so I put on my all of my I have more clergy stuff than this, trust me. Um, but I, you know, I put on everything, and I opened the book, and I put on my glasses, uh, and I put my hand on her head, and I said, I'm going to re read this prayer silently. It's a very powerful prayer. She goes, okay, okay. And in my head, I'm singing, twinkle, twinkle, little star. And she's screaming and writhing. And at the end of it, when I got to up above the world so high, I, I was really, I said, it, it, it came to me later on how poetic that was because, you know, afterwards I said, the family said, this isn't real. Oh, yes, it is, it is, it is. Well, um, sometime later, she was arrested by sheriff's deputies trying to score um, methamphetamines off of an undercover cop. Um, and, you know, lo and behold, um, stop taking methamphetamines and the demons go away. So um, whenever you're dealing with these, these situations, the first thing is if, if somebody is coming to us, well, don't go looking for any of this stuff, please. Please, pretty please. I know uh, watching Ghost Hunters on Sci-Fi Channel is really popular and Things I, I don't know if that's still on or not, but you don't you don't want to go looking for this stuff. If it never happens to you, just just be very thankful and and uh, because you don't really want to um, get involved in this stuff. But if somebody comes to you, you know the, the thing is we're trying to help people with um, coming to the truth, you know. And God is the truth first and foremost. And then the, there's another truth, and that's the truth about yourself. And sometimes we lie to ourselves about um, you know what's how things are so when you're when you're talking about dealing with things that you can't see it's it's good to have a good sense of of um, uh, skepticism uh, and check these things out you know before you believe that there's something walking around in the attic um, you know put some rat traps out you would not believe how many people of ghosts in their house that turn out to be I don't, not not necessarily ghosts. Even sometimes you get a sometimes you know you really score one. You get like the Beelzebub, uh, you know, A.K.A. Um, the possum. Um, <laughs> I'm part Cajun, so we have a recipe for those, but I don't I don't get into that right now. Um, they're nasty. Yeah, eat the shingle. Um, so. Uh, Anyway, uh, I, ho I hope you kind of get, get kind of a, a, a lot of what I've had to do is my own research because, again, saying, uh, or being in the Orthodox Church, not necessarily being really hyper-organized. We don't have like an official, like, here's all these dogmas involved with um, death in the afterlife. If you really look at the scriptures, be it demonology or, or you know, the Bible isn't like, it isn't like, you know, 
the Scottish Book of the Dead. This isn't, or the Egyptian Book of the Dead, or the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which is designed to do what? It's designed to uh, teach you about all the various um, elemental beings or whatnot that your soul has to go through to, to you know, and mastery of this world and all the rest of that stuff, right? Um, the Bible spends very little time, in, in fact, the Old Testament spends almost no time um, really describing any of the stuff that we're talking about. There are these little tidbits, but I think that um, in God's wisdom, he didn't format the scriptures to be a, um, a systematic approach to the spiritual world because he knows exactly what our weakness is. And our weakness is that's the stuff that we would obsess about. Um, and what we would do is we would forget the important things that he has told us about himself and about us and about what we're supposed to do and what it is to, to be united with him and, and to, be a, um, uh, to live according to the image and likeness of God that we've been given. Um, because we would get into like you know naming all the demons and where are they at and is there one over here and um, and get his name um, because that's really important and um, we would get upset because we have a natural curiosity for things that we can't see it and it, and part of it is because we as human beings we don't like things that we can't control. Um, we, we, we seek to control. In fact, you know, there's that whole exploration and we don't have ex explorers really anymore. We have more of like, what do we have? Like extreme sports people, you know, adrenaline junkies. But part of the adrenaline thing is that you're overcoming whatever it is that you're, you're taking control, you're having power over, over things. And that's what these, that's what this would be about. Uh, you know, if, if God simply says, well, the Bible's all about explaining all these angels and principalities and authorities and what layer they're at, what they do and what they don't do, and, and how do you get around them, you know, um, that's all we would be thinking about. We would forget all of the, the really, the weightier matters of the law. Um, so when we're dealing with, with the, the matters of, of these types of situations, it's largely in a, in a pastoral setting which I think is why in, in both East and West, the priests who are largely tasked with doing all the pastoral work have ended up um, shouldering um, this, this burden, this work. Um, because when you're dealing with people, for example, who are um, a, uh, in a um, uh, situation where they're being oppressed by the demonic, um, there's a lot of wounding that goes along with that. Um, people are scared. People, people are, are harmed. And, um, and they're wondering why, you know, uh, as, as wrongheaded as, as that whole thing is, you know, why bad things happen to good people, you know. Uh, well, gee, I don't know. Um, I didn't know that we were good, <laughs> you know. People come to... People come to St. John the Baptist, they go down to the river to, to be baptized in the Jordan, and, and, and here they are coming to, be, to repent, right? And what does St. John call them? You brood of vipers. Wow, John, that was really pastoral of you. Um, most people don't want to hear that, but, but, but you have to ask yourself, is, well, why would God allow these things to happen? There's something that God is, is using these, these incidents and everything else to, to teach us... Um, spiritual lessons that we wouldn't learn otherwise. So at least in our church, um, there is an emphasis that the encounters with evil, the encounters with the demonic, um, are opportunities for us to grow, for, for us to, to learn, rather than merely being, and I'm gonna take this off because now I'm really getting hot. Um, this is all that comes off after this point. I know somebody else <laughs> thought that something else was like... That was another souvenir from Romania. It came in handy. It snowed on me there. Um, so what we're talking about is largely is not a mechanical process. 
we're talking about something that is deeply pastoral. People are suffering. Um, and so when, uh, when, for example, I as a, as a priest, I get a phone call that somebody's having an issue, you know, most of it is um, when you talk about the real, the prayer and, and you have holy water and you're, you're saying, and saying, I've got incense and, and um, um, all of that, that's only a small portion of really what's supposed to be happening. What's really supposed to be happening is you're supposed to be working with people and saying, hey, look, this is, this is how things are. And, um, um, you know, we're going to ask God to come here, but you have to remember is this is all ultimately about you drawing closer to God because that's who we're asking to fix it. I don't, um, I'm at a point um, where, you know, I, I've, oh, I like that one, that's nice. Um, there's the one thing that will get you in trouble in life in the afterlife um, is ego, pride. Um, you know, we live in a world that sort of encourages it. You know, you have to feel good all the time. That's why you got to you know take your Prozac. Um, you know, everything's great, man. Um, we as Christians are really awful with that um, because, you know, the last thing a really depressed and hurting person wants is you going, it's okay, man, you just got to get over it. Um, you know, if we, if we, if you do that, um, you know, one of the, one of the things is that you can talk yourself out of really examining what's going on inside of you because you don't want to see that, because that goes against your narrative that you have about yourself. Well, I'm a Christian, if I was a really, if I was a really good Christian, I would not get angry. I would not have bad days, right? You know, Jesus wept in the Bible, but, you know, that was him. Um, so, you know, we try to make this kind of monodimensional thing that we, that we say, this is how I'm supposed to feel, this is how I'm supposed to think, and everything else. And then you enter into... Um, this world, and uh, when we're talking about spiritual warfare, and if you have that um, very strict worldview, um, you're going to be in trouble very fast. Because the first thing is, we're all subject to being tricked, being deluded, being led off course. Um, one of the first things that, that you have to remember when you talk about this, uh, the, the spiritual world itself, um, man is, is a composite of spiritual material. Look at how, let's go back to, go back to Genesis. Um, God makes man's body from the earth. He breathes into him the spirit, and man becomes a living soul. This is why soul is kind of used interchangeably in the scriptures as you, kind of that union between the body and the spirit. And then it's also kind of like that whole composite of the living person. So we are both spiritual and material, but most of us in our daily lives, our daily routines, we live strictly within kind of the more of the material side of our existence. Um, we have our body that has its physical senses, right? And then we have that Union between the body and the soul, um, it's kind of physically manifested with our, our neurological systems, and it has to do with our thoughts. That's why um, CK, which is that term for soul, becomes psychologia, psychology, okay? So it's our thinking. Um, and again, you see that represented in like the human brain where you have the, the cerebrum, you have this big thing, fluffy thing that has all the big thoughts and, and, and all that. And then down below you have the little knotty thing at the bottom, the cerebellum that has all of the, it, it, it has all of the lower functions of the, of the human person. You know, it, 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 gets all, it gets all the hormones, so it has the real fun. You know, that's what it, you know, with life without a cerebellum is really boring because you just got thinking, 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 and you got lizard brain down at the bottom. It's the bumpy thing that we share with all the rest of the animals, and that's the one that goes, you know, um, eat, run. Um, and, 
you know, and, and those are usually the, the areas that we, that we exist uh, and we use, we exist in those kind of things, our, our thoughts and our feelings. Because that's what a feeling, a feeling is a physical experience. I mean, that's what, the reason that you have feelings is, is very simple. Feelings are what shuts off thought. That's why you don't tell, you don't try to re reason with somebody who's like super mad. You know, when they're like, the, you know, when their face is the color of his shirt or his shirt there, and they're, <laughs> you notice that, you know, to try and tell them, calm down, calm down, friend. Uh, that doesn't work with them because they're having their emotions because that lizard man part of the brain has released its chemicals and has told upper brain, we're not talking to you anymore. We're, we, we've, we've already, the party has started and you're left behind. Mm -hmm. um, which you need to have emotions because emotions are a decision. Okay. And. They're not, however, none of those two things, either the, the physical sensations of emotions or thoughts, are really the whole picture because we have the third part of us, which is our spirit, the pneuma, this, this deep thing that God has breathed into us that connects us to him. We, relate to, we don't relate to God through the physical stuff. We relate to God through that part of our being that um, uh, that He breathed in. That is this this mystical, this deepest part of the heart of man. And this is where you get into the language of the scriptures. And uh, there isn't um, words per se in the scriptures about the thoughts occurring up here. They kind of knew that if they cut your head off, that you died. So your life force is in your head, but your, your thinking, all of that, or the deep perception stuff, they would always point to here. It's your heart, deep within the core of you. And, and, and the eye of that heart is, is this, this spirit, it's sometimes referred to the noose, the eye of the heart that beholds God. And so when, um, uh, when we're talking about the, the spiritual world, that's, that's the part that comes into play. And most of us don't know how that works. We walk around because we've tuned out a lot of the stuff that's going on in our heads, right? You know, why is it, why is it that me everybody wants a medical marijuana card? It's to get out of their heads, right? You know, we're living in an age where we are trying to escape ourselves. That's what, you know, because we've got our phone and that. You know, I sent you a text 20 minutes ago. You didn't respond. What's wrong with you? And we live in this, you know, and, and I have my iPod, and I have all these things, and, I, and, and I, I, you know, on New Year's Day, I watched, you know, 15 episodes of The Walking Dead, and, you know, I'm, you, you, we bombard ourselves with, with, with all of this um, um, mental stuff, and, we, and it's exhausting, but we, but we can't shut it off. You know, you may step out of the subway, but you still feel like you're moving. You, know, you ever been on a boat all day, and the boat's been moving all day, and you get off on land, what do you do? You're like this. Because, but that's, that's how we are as human beings. We, we start to, we accommodate our condition. But when your condition is constantly, the boat is moving, and everything else to the point where you step off, and it's like, I need to shut this off. How do I shut this off? I don't know how to shut, shut it off. Hey, let's try that medical marijuana stuff. Yeah. And we're off to the races. And, or we're not at the races. In fact, we're on the couch. And we've escaped ourselves. So, but again, now let's talk about what I'm going to get into now. I mean, there isn't, there isn't a real systematic understanding of this from the scriptural perspective. You kind of have to go to the whole tradition, which is okay, because, you know, that's what, there's a lot of things we think that we know about the scriptures are the things that actually we've read into it from tradition. Um, you know, how many of you have, have read your Bible and saw the word Trinity, right? And nobody, right? Because it ain't there. Um, and then you read Genesis, and then everybody says, well, did God create the world ex nihilo, you know, out of nothing? And everybody says, oh, yeah, sure. Well, you notice that it's not in Genesis. It doesn't mention that. It's already kind of something is there. God's working with it. Where do you get that one? You have to look elsewhere and everything else, but it isn't. So there's there's clues to these uh, to to the for the answers that we're looking for, but it isn't necessarily going to be something that's that explained um, 
um, very plainly. Um, and the first thing is that, that there's this spiritual world and there are these spiritual beings that are in it. Um, first thing is we have God. And again, you're not going to find in the scriptures really saying God is a non-material existence outside of time. And so there's not a system, you know, it's not, you know, you don't go to the book of systematics theology. Um, there's this God, and you start to, in various ways, pick up the fact that God is omniscient, he's omnipotent, he's this and that. But at the same time, he's sort of described as a person, you know, he's thrown, he's around, and so this. Um, and so you have God as this, this central figure in, in our, our beliefs, and, and then you have man who's created kind of this whole earth thing, and depending upon which version, you know, what order. And, and then there's also these other spiritual beings that are around, aside from the animals and plants and stuff like that. But there's these other beings that we would call, in, in Greek, we have synonyms for the same thing. And one of the synonyms is angelos. An angel. Angelos is a messenger. There's another figure that pops up. Tradition especially gets uh, talks quite a bit about it. And this is a daemon. Um, how many of you have gotten an email kickback and it comes back on a mailer daemon? That's because somebody who did computer stuff was like read classical literature and they were being cute. They're, they probably walked at Oxford and, and had a, a droll accent. And they, oh, we should do this to these Americans. It should drive them insane. They're not going to, especially those, those fundamentalist types. They, 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 we, we should get them out of the internet by, by having them suffer from mailer daemons. <laughs> but a, a, a demon is a messenger. And in fact, if you go back again to the Genesis story, what is the, what is the central problem of, of the first, uh, the second chapter after the whole creation thing? It's a message, right? This serpent comes, and of course the serpent doesn't have arms and legs, so the serpent can't do things. Serpent does not reach out with his hand and grab the uh, fruit, usually represented as an apple, and says, Hey, try this one. You'll like it. It's great. I'll make you such a deal. No. The, the, it's a serpent. All he's got is his mouth. And he delivers a message. And Eve listens to the message, and, um, and, and then Adam, that's the, that's the whole story, you know, Adam, Eve got in trouble for listening to the serpent, Adam got in trouble for listening to his wife, um, but now you have this, the whole um, destruction of that original existence come down through a message. So what does this tell you about, what, what clue does this give you as to what the rest of the story is going to be about? It's going to be about conflicting messages and where you get them from and who gives them to you. And this goes clear to into the New Testament where St. Paul says, who are you getting your messages from? <laughs> you know, you're following strange doctrines. Um, we are constantly or you know are you getting the message from here are you getting it from here are you getting it from from your imagination and so that gets us back to when when you're talking about um these messengers how are they interacting with you if they're not physical beings they're somehow they are beings they're somehow limited they're finite they're inscripted they're not they do, they're not made out of a material they don't exist in space the way that we do as far as a 3d space um, where, how is it that they're going to communicate with you? And so they're going to communicate with you through that same spiritual part of your being. Um, and if you don't know what it is to be in, in that deeper part of who you are, it's very hard to tell when it is that you have an idea that's your own 
versus when you have an idea that is being given to you, okay? This is the first thing you have to be aware of, is that if you're not aware of your own thought life, if you don't pay attention to why it is that you're thinking what you're thinking or where is it coming from, um, how many of you have walked into a room and instantly felt that there was something really wrong there? Okay, the question is this, was that really something originating in you or is there a possibility that there was something that was there who's saying, I'm here and I don't like you? How else are these things going to communicate? Because I'll tell you, the first thing is, if somebody comes and says, oh, I think there's this, this, there's a, there's this Freddy guy living in my closet. And they, how do you know his name is Freddy? Like, is he said so? I said, so you're talking to him. Yeah. And he says, does, does, does Freddy talk to you with an audible voice? And if he says, yeah, I can hear him just as clear as you, they go, okay, guess what? <laughs> it's, let's go talk to a doctor. <laughs> because you have a, a problem. People have <laughs> schizophrenia. It's it's a it does not and it does not rule out that, that somebody who's schizophrenic can't have uh, significant spiritual issue uh, legitimate spiritual problems. Um, but but audible voices are a problem. That's not how these things usually. Now, on the other hand, if somebody comes and said, "Yeah, I, I just get this real intense," you know, somebody saying that they're going to hurt me. It's like it's kind of like a kind of a voice inside of my head, but it's not really words, but it is, and I just know. And everything else. Oh, now we need to stop and and talk to this person some more, because this is this is what we're talking about when we, that uh, the spiritual part of ourselves engaging in sensing and communicating uh, with that with with the spiritual that we're made to do so that intense feeling of like there is something wrong in here if you don't know if you don't know yourself you can't really know what you're getting yourself into okay but um, now what I'd like to do first of all are there are there any questions about what I've said so far anything that's making you kind of go hmm yes so, do you always rule out audible speaking? Uh, no. I mean, there are there are times where you will hear things. Like I mentioned, the knock. Only like for the speaking, because you said if someone's hearing voices, not yeah. as clear as you. Do you? So do you? Uh, if you have more than one witness to it, yeah. then it's real. I mean, the, 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 that's, where, that's where the other thing comes in, is that whenever, you, you, you never want to just say, well, if one person has had this experience, like, for example, when you called me and you said, there's this issue in the house, and then I start talking to them, it's like there's multiple witnesses. I, I don't need to, like, go through the big test thing. If you've got lots of people who are experiencing the same thing, um, then, um, yeah. Um, I mean, these things can make... Uh, when you start getting into this a little bit, I mean, there's, there are times where people will hear, um, you know, voices. Uh, a very common one in demonic in demonic cases is the muttering, the demonic muttering that you'll people will walk through a house and they'll hear some kind of like low voices, kind of whispering and muttering, and all that, nothing distinct. And it's and usually people like multiple people can hear it at the same time. Um, some people just it's just them personally, but um, but the audible voices, generally speaking, everything I'm giving you is general. Everything that there's always exceptions to the rule, but it's just something that you can pretty much pin down. If somebody's having like conversations with someone and they're they're talking back and forth, and nobody else is hearing it, but they're hearing an audible voice. Yeah. 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 Be 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 careful because you you what you want to do is not say ah, you're, you're, you want to get them help right so even how you say that 
you have to be very careful because what you don't want to do is have the person say, he's not listening to me, he doesn't care, he's just another one of these people who thinks that I'm, and they won't listen to you and you can't put your, you, you won't be in that position to tell the person you need to go get some help. You know, if you just flip it off and everything else. So when you do hear that stuff, when the red flags start coming up, you are, you should be working on like a way to try to help get that person the help that they really need. And, and um, unless any of us here's an MD, that's probably not us. So, yes. I wanted to hear you finish your story on you were saying after you said amen, you could hear a knock. Mm -hmm. kind of got sidetracked on that. I'm I am Mr. Sidetrack, by the way. This is this whole conversation is is rabbit trail. So, um, so anyhow, so I I did the did the prayers and afterwards everything stopped for a while. Um, <laughs> well, I was warned I was warned by this this person uh, that I, I was talking to he says, well, if you start helping people, more will come. So pretty soon. Um, every the, the original manifestation stopped. Um, but what happened was um, I'm. <laughs> I should be telling this story on on on, on camera. Um, so I'm I'm hearing confessions when uh, when when after actually it was during the day. This is I know, this, this, the first time it happened was during the day. I'm hearing confessions over the church, and in our church we don't have like the 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 closet cabinet things. We just it's just you sit down next to them, you talk to them, or stand at stand at the table and talk to them. And uh, so um, I'm having this conversation, and there's we right down the hallway there's a church office, and um, oh, is this water? Thank you. I brought some of my own, but it's holy water. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, it does not glow when vampires get near it. <laughs> it's in case you're watching Salem's Lot. Um, so um, I'm I'm talking to this person, and there's somebody in the office, and it sounds like they're looking for the keys to their car, and they have a hot date. Boom, 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 boom. The doors are opening, closing, everything else. And so there's a limited number of people who have access there. And so I kind of walk back there and say, hello. And, and nothing's out of order, everything else. I come back. I start talking to the person again. Boom, 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 boom. Say, Excuse me. I go to the back. Still. Um, third time when I come back, the person I'm talking to says, Looks at me, he says, Father, there isn't anybody back there, is there? And I said, no, there isn't. And he says, can we get this done? And I said, yeah. <laughs> you know, put the stole over him, say the blessing. So let's go. And um, so I started doing regular prayers for these departed. And um, we should probably segue into, I think we should, you wanted to talk a little bit about the soul after death and things like that, yeah? Okay. Um, so, um, anyhow, so, so what ended up happening was, as, as one thing would stop, something else would start, and I kind of realized that what it is, is there, are, there is a line forming. And so I went into the church, and I, after somebody got spooked, because somebody came into the church to get something, and they were confronted by something, and um, so I had to, like, stand there and say, okay, we have a new rule here. You don't scare people, and by that, I don't want you manifesting anymore. This needs to stop, because people who are here are getting afraid, and that's not your job. I know that you're here, and I will pray for you, but you need to stop doing what you're doing. And it stopped, because I asked him nicely. And um, and so I, I commemorate them, I pray for them and all of that. And um, um, there are still things that kind of go on there that are good reminders that that um, I haven't just deceived myself or, or, or anything else, that I know that there are, there's a job to do here, that there's people who need help. And, um, 
and we keep it up, but it isn't like it was before. So there's kind of a running joke amongst people in the church there. He says, hey, have you had any run-ins with Casper lately? And um, Because they'll hear things, or they'll see things. And um, so that should get us to, I think, talking about uh, death and, um, and the intermediate state. Because, you, because obviously the, the question comes up is like, you know, because we've all seen the TV shows, uh, there's ghosts, and what if this ghost is, I don't know, um, some soul, and it just didn't go into the light? It's lost? We have to help it? I mean, God just left them there? You know, what can we do? Well, it's it's not like that. Um, so there's a... Um, a number of references, and again, we're going to go back to the Old Testament where we talk about death. When, when man, well, okay, let's go back even further. Let's go back to, to Genesis. So, um, and again, if I'm, if I'm confusing, raise your hand. Please stop me. The only, thing that's, the only thing that you may not do here during this presentation is shoot at me or snore. Everything else is okay. Um, I, I live on the border with Compton, so the shooting thing is kind of that's, all of our major holidays are are are, are celebrated with seven six two by thirty nine. Yeah. <laughs> Happy New Year! <laughs> Jeez, are we living in Beirut or what? Is yeah. So um, okay, so uh, um, yeah, Beirut's nice these days. It's Damascus. It's kind of scary. So um, uh, where was I? So so man is in the garden. Man disobeys God, man separates himself from God, following after the message of the serpent, and now we have a problem, death. Okay, so here is Adam and Eve, they are created in the image and likeness of God, which is, who is an eternal being. So there is something about their, their humanity that is eternal, right? Not eternal backwards, but at least eternal forwards. Because the image and likeness of God is something that isn't going to just be erased. God doesn't do that. That's not in God's, God's nature. And we're not, we don't have God's nature, but we are somehow through our being, we're designed to participate in it. Okay. So, um, but now you have this problem that man has has is gone into this uh, the state where he is now dying. He is dying because he has separated himself from God, and in a very significant way. And so God then so the Adam and Eve hide, and rather than fess up for what they're they've done, what do they do? They blame somebody else. Because that's what we do as human beings. They don't repent. And so God fashions for them these garments of skin. And so that to that original body, soul, and spirit is added something that is, um, that is biological. Okay? That is heavy, let's say. The garments of skin. And these become the way by which God clothes man with something that is able then to absorb this blow of death, because otherwise man is going to die eternally, right? Okay? There's an e this eternal death. But by introducing this biological death to man, you have this uh, state where man dissolves to some extent. There's this, this renting of the body and the, and, the, and the soul and the spirit. There's this, this breaking apart and it, it's described as going to sleep. Okay? Not like his sleep, but like a, this deeper one. And... Um, <laughs> yeah, you, and that's an accomplishment for these days. I have to wear one of those mouth guard things for my snoring. As, as my wife was like, you know, either, yeah, but uh, you got to get out of the house if you're not going to wear that thing anymore. Um, so good for you. You can sleep without snoring. 
um, it's a laugh a minute here with the, with the dead crowd. Um, so now, um, so man dies, but there's this problem that he's not, he's dead, but he's not dead. Because again, that image and likeness of God can't simply die and not exist anymore. Okay? So you have a problem. Um, the the God's safety net of this kind of the putting the garments of skin on man and allowing this this blow to be absorbed by that allows man to go down into this 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 state that is referred to in the Old Testament as Sheol as as, as the pit and all through the Psalms if you want if you know you have a long evening um, and you go through and you do all 153 Psalms um, you're going to read them all. And you'll notice that time after time, there's this, um, uh, 153 psalms? 150. Are we doing 151? Yeah, 151 for us. I, I, me and numbers, remember the whole thing about taking the shoe off? So ask me how many states there are. It's like 72. Obviously, the president said that. No. Um, so, hey, we have something in common. Um, so um, uh, yeah, so you read, go and you read. We, yeah, we have we have a, a division. We follow the, the the. There's one of the psalms that we split that they don't. And um, um, so, uh, but you go and you read all the psalms and this it references again and again and again to um, the pit. And uh, and it it, it uh, let's see the pangs of death surrounded me the the floods of ungodliness made me afraid the sorrows of Sheol surrounded me the snares of death confronted me in my distress I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God um, this is describing dying okay um, um, you are and once you end up in this, um, uh, for I Isaiah 38 is another one. Indeed, for it was my own peace that I had great, great bitterness, but you lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption, for you cast all my sins behind your back. For Sheol cannot thank you, death cannot praise you. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your truth. The living, the living man, he shall praise you. As I do this day, the Father shall make known... Um, your truth to the children. Um, again and again, it, there's a reference that those who go down to the pit can no longer pray to God. The living can pray, the dead cannot. Does that make sense? I at first I had a hard time with it. I thought, well, why can't why can't the um, the the dead pray? Because after all, we pray with our our melons, right? It's a thinking thing, right? Prayer. And then I joined the Orthodox Church and found out, oh, no, 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 no. No, prayer is body, soul, and spirit. All three things are involved in prayer. And if you think about it, something that's dead can't pray by its very nature. But it's not, prayer isn't just simply a thing that you think about. Um, it is something that you do as a complete person. So... Um, so once that, that unity is broken, the ability to pray is, is, is gone. So now you have all of these generations who are dying and going down into Sheol, going down into Hades. Hades is the Greek word for death. It doesn't connotate anything in particular. It's not hell, it's not eternal damnation. It's just, it's death. In fact, the God of the underworld is... Hades, you're dead. But everybody's going down there, and there are some that are experiencing it as uh, as as torment, and there are, there are others that are experiencing it as um, um, kind of rest. We see this in the in the gospel where Christ talks about the rich man Lazarus. Everybody remembers that one, right? And so you have this kind of a, 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 there's a gulf, there's this division, there's something that's between the two of them, but they're all still in this same place. They're just experiencing it in very different ways. Um, and they are cut off, and yet 
they are able to talk to one another. Okay, this is very important. The rich man has a conversation not with God, but with Abraham. Five points. Um, no, we're not giving out points in this thing, but but that's you see. There's a, yes, okay. I'll double it. Give me a ten and a gold star. Um, but this the there is this this. Um, and Psalm 87 says it again, will, will you work wonders for the dead? Will, shall the dead arise and praise you? Shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave or your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Um, Psalm 114, the dead, shall, the dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. Um, death is this place where one is cut off from God. So now... You have all these people who are down there, and what happens next? Well, we have Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is born of the Virgin Mary, right? He's made man, crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, and suffered and was buried. Third day rose again, according to the scriptures, sent to heaven, said the right hand of the Father, which come again, glory, judge, the living and the dead. His kingdom shall have no end. It doesn't really get into the, the, the uh, Nicene Creed, doesn't really skips over the one part where we say that, that Christ at death goes down into this condition of Hades, right? Um, and, um, and it's interesting how um, in, in, most, in most human lore, there is, an, there is a notion of this concept called paradise, right? It's this wonderful place. It's happy hunting grounds. It's Valhalla, uh, uh, whatever whatever your deal is, right? There's this great place. If you're in Islam, it, it comes with uh, with a brothel. Um, if you're the right kind of Muslim, I guess. So, but what is it that happens in 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 Christianity is is something that's different because when Christ is hanging on the cross. And the thief confesses his, his um, he's, you know, what does he say to him? Today you will be with me in paradise. Where is Jesus a couple hours later? It's not paradise. He's in Hades. He's in Hades. He's not in paradise. Because remember, so that he appears a while, a couple, you know, a little while later, and says, you know, I've not yet ascended to my father. He hasn't gone up to heaven. So what is paradise? Paradise for us is Christ. Just like he is, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Right? He's paradise. He is paradise. Wherever he is, that's paradise. Hanging on the cross, to some extent, is Paradise. It hurts. Uh, I don't think he would call it that. But, but what he was what he was saying was that that that, that he was going to make this 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 uh, wherever he is, paradise. He is life. So Christ goes down into Hades, and there's this little problem that arises because you die because you sinned, and he hasn't sinned, and so he doesn't belong there. But there's a problem. He's dead. Now, unlike the resuscitation of Lazarus, Lazarus comes this back way out of the tomb, right? Okay. Same Jesus, the same way that, that, that he came in, he came back into the world. But remember, Lazarus still has to die again because he still has that same broken humanity that is that is subject to death right so the problem with Lazarus then is Lazarus would be stuck in this perpetual uh, death cycle and it starts looking like you know Osiris and the flooding of the Nile and something like that right you know this is sort of the the you know he, he just he's stuck in a, in a cycle it doesn't work there has to be something else so Christ goes down in there he can't get his old body back. He's dead. He's, he's undergone that death. So he's got to go some other way. 
So um, if I had a blackboard, I would, I would draw something like this, is Jesus blows out the back end of this pit. The doors are still opening and closing as far as the, the doors of death because people are still dying. But the gates that kept us from paradise, that kept us from God, are now gone. Boom. So the dead are still entering into this, this, this condition of death. And now when they get down there, they're not coming back out the other way. Now the question is, is where do you go from here? Now we believe it. What did Christ do? He led the captives free, right? And if you go all the way to the book of Revelation there, you see there's the altar, and there's all the souls, and they're saying, when, O oh Lord, when will our blood be avenged on the earth, right? When can we go back, right? So they're not in Hades. They're somewhere else. So Hades becomes a, a path, a passageway, a a, a transition that one goes from this physical life to being alive in Christ. Because remember, is if you're with him, you're alive. You're in paradise. You're okay. You're, okay. you're not completely where you want to be, because otherwise there wouldn't be that dialogue in Revelation about the soul saying, when can we go back, right? Because they would say, hey, cool, the man this heaven thing is really awesome. I'm into that. The interesting thing is we can enjoy that and realize that that's not us. That we're not purely spiritual beings. That we are body, soul, and spirit. We are composite of these things. And so the most appropriate thing for us is to be back in that, into those renewed uh, body, soul, spirit, back together in the New Jerusalem, in the presence of, of, of God, right? United with him. With me so far? Pretty much makes sense, right? Okay, so now we've got the next big question. What do you do? You die. You go into this, this, this condition of, of death. It's not really a place. We think of it as a place because we're, we think that way. And you are not, um, you know that if you keep going that way, there's Christ. And you love him. And you also realize that in this life, you largely ignored him. What do you do? What does a loving God do? Now, if you think that the loving God is, is going to say, doesn't matter, you loved me, but you still were negligent, and I hold it against you, <laughs> I should do it this way, you are going to hell, I don't like you very much, because you didn't take care of me. Um, does God do this? Does God simply take man and say, you know what, I gave you X amount of time, and you went through it partying with your friends and drinking cheap beer and, and not going to church on Sundays because you had a hangover and all that. And therefore, you have no part of me. I'm done with you. Is this the God that you know? This is an important question. Is this the God that you know? There are some people, that's the God that they know. Okay, and so the, this conversation past this point is not going to make sense to them because they go, of course, God's like, he's watching. He's, he's got more notes than Santa Claus on, on what I've been doing or what everybody else has been doing. And naughty and nice and everything. And if you don't, okay. What if God says, tell you what, the door's open. I'm over here. You can come anytime. Work it out. Work it out. I'll wait for you. The last judgment isn't for a while. I know when it's coming. You don't. So there's kind of an urgency. 
you probably don't want to be down here for a while because it's really nice on the other side. It's me. But what if God gives us, the, because here's the thing is when we die, we don't become psychologically other than who we were when we were alive, right? There's no evidence for that in the scriptures at all. There's no evidence that says that at death somehow who we are as, as, as people is somehow radically changed at death. And in fact, the, the Christ's resurrection bears witness to the fact that he is totally who he was before he went on the cross because the holes are still there. Christ does not come back being other. Physical, but I mean even who he is as a, as a, as a person, okay? There's no evidence that, that death somehow changes that. In fact, what we would say is that it's actually what death does is it brings clarity to that because no longer do you have the distractions of this life. You don't have the excuses because we hide behind all of this material. We hide behind all that fun brain chemistry, right? We feel guilty about our sins, and instead of repenting and, and, and going and confessing our sins the way that the scriptures tell us, so you confess your sins to one another, you know, instead of going and getting absolution and squaring things away with God, what do we do? I know what I do. It's called ice cream. <laughs> or, I don't know, uh, food. Some people, it's Jack Daniels. Some people, it's... Um, gambling and they hide from their consciences but their consciences still bother them there you know, there's some people that consciences don't bother them one bit those are the people who say god and no room for you okay you know what stay there you know the lord doesn't send a couple of archangels down with tranquilizer guns saying when those souls come through just nail them knock them out and drag them into the heaven of paradise when it wears off they're going to be in they're going to love it so much they're going to forget about all that stuff god does not force us to do it he doesn't force us to do anything in this life at all why would he start forcing it at that point exactly so what we believe is that that just as as there is this this um, there is a, a space in which God allows the dead to process um, the reality of, of who they are and enter into that rest in him um, even past this point of physical death. Because we're still processing all of these things. And, um, but there's a problem there that I brought up. And what is that problem? What if part of what you're processing is that you really want to pray to God and ask for his mercy, but you can't pray anymore because you're dead? So that's where something comes in, and I want to find. By the way, that Psalm 87 says, I'm like a deaf man who can't hear, and a man with no tongue who should not speak in this not to a Yep. I'm looking for something in specifically here. Um, Uh, I didn't bring that section, uh, I, but uh, yes. Is, is negated the inferno? No. Oh, because when when the same creed that you read mm -hmm. in Spanish, mm -hmm. it says, uh, and and the envió a los infiernos, he descended to the inferno. It, it means like there were different sections. Yeah, I, I um, the. I may, you know maybe maybe there's a different theological meaning to that in Spanish than there is in 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 what we have in English, but it isn't that it isn't that Christ actually went down in because here's the thing is you can't torment Christ for his sins in that in that sense um, you know we don't um, we don't we don't see that happening there yeah. Yeah, maybe the term inferno is a sort of a generalized idea of 
I don't know, Hades, yeah. Um, so what do you say when you absent with the body to be present with the Lord? Mm-hmm. As, as, in, as in that death part. <coughs> well, I mean, here's the thing, is it, to, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Well, you're talking about now entering into the spiritual realm, okay, the heavens, this, uh, which is which is again a loose, very loose term because there are spirits of the air, let's say, and the terms heavens and air are used interchangeably, and all that. But um, when you when you say uh, absent from the body is present, present with the with the Lord. Well, what about what about the rich man? He's absent from the body. Is he present with the Lord? Yeah, but this is this is uh, post post resurrection. Same thing though. Doesn't say that. Are, are you saying if you say that be absent from the body to be, is to be present with the Lord? It doesn't say for only those who are upright, for only those who are saved. It doesn't say that. It just is. It's it's a very general. It's a very general statement. So you're saying everybody, the righteous and the wicked, all go to the presence of the Lord? Of course. Wow. That's why for the righteous it's nice, and for the wicked it's bad. So. You can't, here's the thing is, you can't, as someone who hates God, you can't experience the presence of God and have it be nice. So then the presence of the Lord, not cast out of his presence, separated from his presence, but having a bad time in the presence of the Lord while we're rejoicing before his face. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what, that's what you see in Isaiah. Oh sure, no, no. I mean, that's that's Isaiah. If you look at the end of Isaiah, what? How does Isaiah present the resurrection? But you're saying I, I stated it correctly, right? Yeah, that everybody is. Uh, uh, the one thing is, if you will, not just we're here's the thing is, right now we are in the presence of God. Well, right it's now. The presence of the presence. That's tautological. That's not sure. Theological revelation. I'm talking more specifically in the sense of you know. Destiny, judgment, uh, redemption. But we're always in the presence. We're always in the presence. No, but it needs everybody in the presence. Of course, of course. And, w and what you're talking about at death is, and what you're talking about at death is, is the is the is the further realization of that, because again, you've lost the distractions. You can get lost in this material world and not see Christ in everyone's face. You can get lost in this world and say, yeah, there's a place where I can get away from God. Right, I can so go here. But here's the fallacy to me is that there's a, there's a very broad definition and there's a very narrow definition. Mm -hmm. When I speak of it, I'm using the narrow definition. I'm mm -hmm. using a huge, broad, all-encompassing one, so everything just fits in there. We're talking theologically, the definition I think is much more narrow. You're saying, well, theologically, you know, I mean, in a broad sense, yeah, well, everybody's in the presence of God. No, but I mean, even even on even in a, in a narrow sense, I mean, w again, go go look at Isaiah, the end of Isaiah, where there's the New Jerusalem. It's surrounded by who? Sure, just like the Book of Revelation. Okay. When you're cast out of His presence, apart from me, you know, the lake of fire. Right, but at the but at the same time, that there there they are, surrounding the New Jerusalem. So you say that's before final judgment. No, after. Even after. Because they're not eliminated. They don't. The, the damned aren't like the end. So, you know. so there is presence after death, before judgment, and there is presence after you know following the judgment for eternity. Yeah. In a broad sense, I think we would agree with that. In, in, sense, in the narrow sense, you're saying there's very there we're cast out, separated, 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 separated from God, mm -hmm. spiritually separated, separated from God on um, on the present plane. Yeah. Is the thing is it's it's exactly it's it, the problem is it, it is a it is it is an it's an eternal it's a circular problem for the damned it's a circular problem it's it's that they're they are they are continually cast out of the presence of God. And yet they are continually in his presence at the right, same so time. That's, that's, I agree with that. And theologically, there's two senses of being out of God's presence. I mean, for the wicked, we, I think we all agree in this room that the wicked will be cast out of God's presence. But in a broad sense, you know, since God is omnipresent, we're all going to be. But you're, ta you're also talking about a spiritual world as where is the, where's the present? Where is the presence? 
Yeah. In the spiritual world, you know, we're thinking about all that spiritual world. Well, there's a presence of God over here, and there's a not presence over there. Because we think, uh, it, how's, that, how's that work in the spiritual world? It doesn't, because there is no there. You know, we're, we're, talking about, we're talking about things that we use this, uh, we use very imprecise language. The Bible does talk, even despite God's omnipresence, it definitely has God in a centralized sense where the Bible says, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. In a sense, even though God is omnipresent, he still is localized in a specific sense in heaven, which is the body of Christ. No, no, heaven. We're, 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 that's the cloud of witnesses in heaven. We're down here. So in a, in a sense, you know, we're going to be joining that cloud in heaven, which is God's thing. The earth is, the heaven and earth are separate. It's called the third heaven. Well, there's... Again, you, you you know we're using figurative language. Yeah. You know, it's and just. I've read this in the Bible. What's that? I mean, the way I've read it, it's not very Christian. I haven't seen it, but it's all good. Different tradition. Yeah. There's the the thing that you're we're looking at is that the the problem of of let's say the presence of, of God. It's. You know, again, we're talking about a, a, a spiritual reality. It isn't like, but for example, um, how do I show you this? You know, we like to think of like, well, heaven is up and, and hell is down. But it isn't really that way. So when we're talking about these various levels of heaven and everything else, these are, these are things that are really... Um, how should we say? They're, they're ways of expressing directional. directional stuff, but it isn't literally like there's like, okay, you know, exiting level two, entering level three. There, there's demarcations and things like that. You know, we're not, we're not, we're not dealing with that because it's, it's a spiritual reality. Yes? Um, just, just real quick, I also want to touch on, because we're running out of time. Uh, are we? Is that right? Yeah. 920. It's 9 what? 920. Yeah, mine says 9.56. Oh, I've been using that clock. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, well, okay. Right. Who were you praying for? Was that a demon or was that a departed? Just a, a, a brief summary. Yeah. On that. Well, the, the, there's, the thing is that those, what we can do as a church, uh, for example, when, when King David um, buries Saul and Jonathan and his brothers, this is afterwards, he had, a, he had a week-long fast. He had a fast and he prayed for them. Um, we as the church could still pray for those who departed. If they feel that they need to pray to God and they can't, we can pray on their behalf. Um, that's the whole notion of, 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 of spiritual manifestations in a house and things like that is very often it's about people manifesting saying pray for me for whatever reason God has allowed them to manifest there. Um, when we talk about demonic manifestations, totally different category. In human, people, human manifestations, you get little knocks, things get moved perhaps, there's these small things. Demons, however, it's different. They move big objects if they want to. There's clawing. Um, they're almost always the demons have a strategy, and it is back to that strategy of the message. There's a message that they want to deliver, and and they don't have the ability to do these own things. You know, demons don't walk around killing people. So if demons want to destroy human beings, how do they do it? They get you to they get you to do it for them. Remember, the serpent has no hands. So the demons are engage, begin to engage in a game up here that says, uh, let's, let's play with them a little bit. Let's mess with them. Let's scare them. Scare them to the point they'll make a deal. Maybe this one won't make a deal directly, but they'll make a deal with somebody else. Give me this one. If you look at, if you look at like, for example, medieval European... Uh, the witch trials, which, by the way, when you hear all this stuff about the Inquisition and the witch trials and everything else, the Roman Catholic Church, as much as we, you know, don't, oh, they're bad and everything else, they had a 90-some-odd percent acquittal rate on their witch trials. 
Because actually, what people don't realize is witch trials were a civil matter. It was the king who did the witch trials. And then the church had to go in there and say, well, hold on a second, can we, can we, can we have a chat here? Um, but demons are involved in one thing. They want to get man to turn on God, turn on one another, and ultimately turn on themselves. Suicide is the victory of the demon because he will get you to destroy the own image and likeness of God that is within you. It's the ultimate thing. So when you, are, when you begin to deal with people who are demonically, there's, there's various levels of demonic oppression that lead up to um, a full possession. It's always a, a mind game over the person trying to get them depressed, trying to get them upset, trying to get them angry. Um, again, able to communicate thoughts and ideas to us that we don't recognize as not being our own. Um, in, the, in the Orthodox Church, for example, when you enter into monasticism, um, you're, the un understanding is the final, the, f the first step is when you become a, a, a new monk, you receive a belt, and it's the idea is that you tame your body, and you're no longer uh, just living according to your, your physical lusts. And then the next one is you receive like a little hat, and you get a cross, and this paramon, and, and some of these other things, and this is where you begin to battle with your thoughts, your thought life. And then the final one, when you, you enter into what they call the great schema, which the great hat is this, they receive this mantle and it's covered with crosses and it's embroidered with these exorcism prayers because the monk has now defeated his body, he's defeated his mind, and now he enters into direct conflict with Satan and the devils. He's now fighting it out. This is why you read the life of St. Anthony to understand what that's all about. Um, but, the, but the demonic... Um, is uh, in, in entirely, and this is where, again, when you're talking about dealing with people pastorally, you're having to undo those messages that these people have bought into. And this is why very often exorcisms take years in some cases. Some very short. I've had some short, short issues. There are ones that, are, that can be very long. And they take a long time because it takes a long time to root those things out. The one thing that we always have to remember, though, is that God is holding on to the leash. You know, when we go in, and, and when, when I go in and I'm praying, um, you know, uh, I don't know if you, you all remember, um, uh, you know, Jude 1.9, but when the archangel Michael contending with the devil disputed about the body of Moses, he did not presume to predict pronounce a reviling judgment upon him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Okay? It is God who is doing these work, this, this work, uh, and that is why I say don't, don't ever presume to do any of this stuff um, um, on your own and say, well, I can, I can handle this. I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. And gosh darn it, people like me. Um, you're, you're treading in a world because one of the things that you don't know about, about that demon, and, and, and particularly when you're dealing with people who come to you for, for, for advice or whatnot, is they're only going to give you as much information as they feel like sharing. And usually they start with the information that makes them look good first. And it isn't for after a while until like the real truth comes out. Like I got called to a house, they said, well, my kids are seeing stuff and this and that. And, and I, you know, and then pretty soon something comes out about grandma selling the family to the devil when they lived in Mexico years ago. And, and then there was this little thing about the, the father of the house and he was talking to some spirits and they were telling him things. And um, finally had to say, you know, that has to stop. Oh, but they're my friends. It's like, yeah, that's why it took you this long to tell me about this part. And uh, later on, he found out that they weren't his friends. So off they went. So, um, anyhow, does that kind of cover? I'm sorry, I was looking at the. I, I should have had my uh, my own clock out here. Yeah, I was not. I, I just kept looking up and going like, I told you, I'm bad with numbers, and I just kept looking up and said, those look like the right numbers to me. So I just I never thought that it was not working. So anyhow, um, so. That's, uh, any more questions? Do you see that more um, of those experiences are in the 
diverse community uh, cultures like Latin American cultures or more in here? Oh, you see them. At, you see them everywhere. It's just that, like most most like kind of modern American people, because of the religious uh, makeup of kind of um, um, Americans and kind of mainline Protestant and things like that, um, they tend not to acknowledge those kind of things. So there's a lot of people with ha problems in their houses and stuff like that, and they just don't talk about it. Or they yes. How busy are you actually really doing this? I mean, are you consistently on a weekly thing where it's that? It goes like that much out there. It goes. It goes like it, go, it goes like it goes in. It goes in cycles because I don't listening as I don't. I advertise myself. I'm an exorcist. Here's a, on my card and everything else. I don't like to do this kind of thing because I, my phone starts ringing. I and here's here's the thing is that, in very short order after you contacted me, I had two other priests contact me asking for advice on dealing with with their issues and they're from completely different areas. So I go, okay, I guess I got to go to this thing because it's, it's that time again. Um, I, my, my first duty is my parish, you know, um, that's, I mean, by, by my first, first thing is, you know, take uh, my spiritual life, my family, my parish. This is something that is definitely side. Uh, a good portion of the things that people bring to me, either like one time, it just you bless the house and it's gone, or you find out that it's mice or it's methamphetamines, and you 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 get rid of that and 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 uh, but it tends to go in cycles. So yes. Me, a lot of this event too has to do with discernment. You know, be able to walk in the spirit and be be able to discern, right? Yeah, well, dis discernment discernment starts with discerning yourself. If you don't know who you are, um, and uh, you know that if you can't if you can't see yourself clearly, then all the rest of the stuff is is just because you know we're we're all still processing it with the same you know interior world, and and that's why. Uh, your own discernment is almost always wrong. You want to go with a couple of other people too, and you go and say, "Hey, you know something here?" Go, yeah, okay. Th then you've got if you've got a couple, three people who are all noticing the same thing, then um, then you're on the right track. But if you try to solo it, say, "Well, I, you know, you know, even even for me to look this great, I still have to get in front of a mirror." You need that. Uh, you need that mirror. Okay. You need something outside of yourself to know yourself as well. So that's the thing: is if you're in, if you're, if you're, if you're, if your spiritual life is something that's strictly self-governed, you got a problem. But excuse me. Because, you're saying, yeah. uh, in the case of, uh, let's, for example, if there's a demon, a person who's demon possessed. Mm-hmm. Um, then, then, oh, definitely, you don't want to. You want as much as many people coming in praying also. I would I would take that person to someone who has the the training and the the experience. If you if you if you try to if you try to deal with these things, you know the the um, you know we're under, for example, me as a priest, I'm <laughs> under supervision. I don't do these things of my own. If you're not in in under that supervision, if you're not under that system, it can get. The, even under supervision, there are a lot of, of guys that have gotten in, into this into this work who have imploded. Okay, they fall into the temptations because Satan does not like it when you mess with the system because it works for him. And so I say, don't, do not get involved. You take this to take uh, if you find something with somebody, talk them into going and getting help. But you know, there's a lot of people who get into into trying to do these things on their own. I said, don't go there. Don't go there. It's like, yes. I've got a question. Yes. Do you go by yourself or do you have a partner that goes with you? It depends. Um, it, I answer that question. Yeah. I mean, you could send out a pot and then win the parish. Yeah. You couldn't cast out the demons that people have passed the crane. So that's the reason I brought that question. Right. Um, trying to get other priests to go, hey, you want to go do an exorcism? They go, no. So if I can get help, I don't like to go into a sit. I definitely don't like to go into a situation by myself. Um, there's a lot of times where, um, 
you know, I, I definitely don't do anything just one on one. Um, that's just absolutely that's that's madness. Um, but it depends on what you mean by going with somebody else. I mean, I may have um, there's been only been a few occasions where I've gotten another clergyman, usually because I'm going to help him, and then I end up getting the lead on it. Um, um, but um, you know, if I'm going to like deal with a family or whatnot, I've got the whole family there. I can go by myself, kind of a thing. Um, but I definitely have people also, you know, praying for me. In the, in the, uh, you know, and, and if I give a situation that is um, beyond the one-time deal, because I go in and, and do an initial thing, but if something's going to involve me making a commitment, um, then I have to let my bishop know because I need to be under obedience. Because he could say, no, I don't want you to do that. And I go, okay, I stop. Um, but again, we're under system because here's the thing is if I, let's say I, somebody says, I want you to do an exorcism on so-and-so, and I just, I don't do any of the usual preparations. I just go ahead and start doing it. And you start hitting that, like, the, for example, the, the woman with the methamphetamines problem. She's writhing, and she gets a heart attack and dies, you know, and I get to report that to my bishop. He's going to be very disappointed with me. So if I have anything that's going to be that's going to be like that, I need to make sure that that I'm covered. I have to be under obedience. So um, yes. I think maybe we jumped to it because we just said we would never do one to one because that would be madness. I'm wondering why. That's why because it could go wrong. Something could go wrong. Um, you know, I, I heard about a there was a, a famous Catholic priest who was doing a lot of exorcisms. He started visiting a certain woman one-on-one -on -one sessions and something happened and so he's he's in a monastery repenting um, you know you just don't know I mean even now like if I, if I go and I do lectures I record them and this is recorded so it's kind of safe I know but because people misunderstand things they mishear things um, you know I was a deacon I was teaching Sunday school and I got hauled in by the Dean of the Cathedral and he said uh, Last Sunday, one of the parents came to me and said, you told their daughter in, uh, in Sunday school class that it was okay to have, for dating couples to have sex. And I was like, I didn't say anything like that. So then I remembered that his daughter was there. And so I said, I just tell you what, ask your daughter uh, about that. And, and, and whatever she says, is, 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 uh, I'll go with. And it was really funny because I didn't hear about it afterwards. And I saw the daughter like the next Sunday. I said, did you talk to your dad about me in Sunday school? And she goes, oh, yeah, I can't believe my dad would think that you, I'd let you get away with saying something like that in my Sunday school class. So, Way to go, kid. Um, yeah, you just, you just have to be careful because you can get accused of anything. You stole my money. You, you slapped me. You, know, you go to Europe. You saw this in Rome. They got straps. They use leather straps on people, right? You do that in the United States, and they'll put cups on you. Because <laughs> you have to just objects fly. Mm -hmm. Notice there when he's talking about how he does it, how it's all calm and <laughs> mellow. The exorcists in Rome is like they walk into a room and after like three minutes, I command you, and it's like demons are like, bring it. And they're flying into walls, you know, people levitating, walking backwards, vertically, spitting nails. Priest, which is ugly, you know, the stories that you hear there. And so, this mellow approach, but uh, also, also, prayers of liberation, right? Like, you have discernment or whatever. All believers, I'm going to Rome. I'm not a Roman Catholic. I just went there because I wanted exorcism when I was Catholic. And I got it. But, uh, um, prayers of liberation is something all of us can pray, right? Exorcism is something you. According to Rome, you should leave the exorcist and just like Father George says, you know, let somebody else that's trained in the matter deal with it because you kind of don't want to have anything to do with it. Well, you're, you know, there's a temptation. There's a temptation sometimes when when you're in that kind of fight to to say something like, well, you know, come at me, bro. And and the thing is, they go, great, thanks for the invite. You know. That's where when I'm when I've got the the, the stuff here is, is I'm I'm scared, I'm scared. You know why I'm scared? It's not because of God. It's because of me. I don't want to say anything stupid, so I stick with the book. It's real easy. You follow the book. You don't say anything stupid. You go off the book. You'll say something stupid, and they'll take you up on it because that's what they do. 
you know, they play the they play the Philadelphia lawyer game. Yes. I think you um, you missed the progression of how demons take over. That might help. You know how they well, act and, and how they when they come in they first. Well, yeah, I mean that that's the whole thing. You know, getting back to what you're uh, touching a little bit on what you're saying there is when when you're talking about. Um, most of the time when people deal with a problem in their house, let's say, I ask them, it's like, well, when have you told it to stop? And they go, I can do that? It's your house! And there's so many times where they, the people, what they do is like, okay, um, you got a house, right? And you start hearing something up in the attic, and, and what do you do? You go, oh, there's something up in the attic. I better not go up there. And you stop going in the attic. And guess what? They go, thank you. Let's try the basement. So the next thing is you're hearing something in the basement. So what do you do? You run down there. You make sure you don't spend a lot of time in there. Now you've given them the basement. Hey, okay, great. Then the kitchen. Then pretty soon they're walking the hallways, right? And you're in the thing with the hallways. So what do you do? You keep your, your, your door closed at night, right? And the next thing is they're in the closet. And then the next thing is they're staying at the foot of your bed. And that's when you call me. There's something staying at the foot of my bed. And I said, did you tell it to stop? And they go, well, no, go, but it's your house. This is why the question is, you know, can, can non-Christians do exorcisms? Well, of course a non-Christian could say, get out of my house. You know, the difference, the difference with most, like, let's say, a, a, a typical pagan exorcism, how many of you have ever seen, like, Survivor Man, there's Les Stroud, and he goes around, and remember, lately he's been doing things where he's gone into all these, like, uh, uh, tribal people to see how there's survival things, and did one where he went to, like, this demon the demon dance in Madagascar or something like that. And a lot of those exorcisms are about appeasing the demon. That's how they do the exorcism. They say, hey, we'll give you, we'll give you this bowl of fruit if you leave the person alone. The demon says, congratulations, I've tra you're, you're trained well. Um, that's another thing that will happen often with, with these things is that um, they bang around in the ceiling, they bang around in the, in the attic, you go up to the attic. Then they bang around in the basement, you go down to the basement. And pretty soon they've got you running up and down the stairs. Congratulations, you're trained. Do you think it's because it's more of a authority thing? It's all about obedience. You know, what is, what is magic about? You know, evil isn't real. Evil isn't a substance. God didn't make it. It doesn't exist. So what is what's what is it that's going on with like witchcraft and magic and things like that? It's you have you're 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 interacting with a demonic being. The demonic being isn't a prisoner of your chalk circle. They don't care. They're not even material. What is a chalk circle going to do? They step out of it, but they want you to believe that it's real. So they'll play your game. But in the end, what are you doing? You are, by engaging in, in ritual magic and things like that, is you're being obedient to their rules. They're training you. You're taking their message. It's exactly what they want. We either do the things that we're, we're told to do to serve God, or we serve them. Who are you, who are you obeying? Uh, this hand that was over here. You said... Um you're doing this, you have to know who you are. Mm -hmm. Who are you? Who am I? I'm George. No, but that is for, to know that you're George, but to the, when you're doing the exercise, do you have to say who you are? Or just the no, they know. They know generally who I am when I show up. I mean, they've been talking about it for a while. You know, you're, you're, you're dealing with things that aren't, you know, uh, th that's another thing too. Is that you know, when you're dealing with when you're dealing with a a demon, you're actually dealing with a team. They usually work in like a large group, and they've got there's kind of uh, there's a little bit of an order to it, and you have to kind of understand what you're what you're what you're dealing with. But they're watching. They know all the stuff, um, and sometimes it's kind of embarrassing. Like I was doing and it's, uh, exorcism with somebody, and and that's why I always go to confession before I, I go because they can't. The things that you repented of aren't, aren't the things that they're going to use against you. It's the things you haven't repented of. And it was really funny because I've, I've kind of have an, an ongoing problem in my family. And this demon tells the person I'm dealing with, says, have, have him ask him about this. Have him ask him about this. So after, after I you know, get this session, it says the demon is saying, he says, I'm supposed to ask you about so-and-so. I go, oh. very funny.
they have access. They have because they got a big team. They got a big network. They got the biggest network in the country. They get six 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 bars everywhere. <laughs> So they know, and that's the thing about getting into, you know, they don't read your thoughts, but they, they've already been, they've been tape recording everything. So they know what's going on. They know what you're doing in private. Think they're going to use it against you? Absolutely. They think they're going to make you paranoid. They're going to scare you. They're going to remind you of things. And then this, this is the head game. So then the head game goes from being at the person that you're working with because you think that you're, you, you really got it on them, and now it's on you because you invited yourself into the situation. Be careful. Now, it's also oh, hold on, there's a gentleman in the back who's been waiting here. Yeah, um, what's your position on Acts 19, 11 through 16, where they use the ancient ship, and that carries some kind of uh, ability to uh, heal and do exorcisms? Yeah. Oh, for example, I've got a, I've got a whole bag of tricks in here. <laughs> I've got all kinds of things that uh, I'll... I'll, I'll uh, I'll take your handkerchief and raise you a, a crucifix. <laughs> and I got a bottle of holy water. I have a big jug in my car. Um, yeah. And some oil, too. And, and the thing is that all of those things, it isn't like, you know, this is where you have to be careful of magical thinking. Um, we bless, you know, when, when, I, when you take a crucifix, okay, you saw this in Rome, right? You take a crucifix, you put on a demoniac, and go, well, why? What is, what is it that is about this that, that the demons despise? Does this have something on it? My faith. My faith is weak. It's God. When you're, when we're talking about holy water and you're sprinkling holy water in, it isn't like you have a bottle of Jesus juice and you're just flinging it around <laughs> and you're getting him on. No, it's, this is important to remember is that when we, when we pray for these things, like that cross and it's blessed, we ask that the Holy Spirit be present, that the Holy Spirit descend into that water. And we don't say descend in there temporarily and then come out. We're asking for God's presence. His presence is what we're asking for when we sprinkle that holy water. We're asking God to do something. It's not that God takes some of his energies, cuts them off, sticks them in the, in the, in the holy water font, says, here, have, have fun. So when, these, when you're taking that cross and you're, and you're pressing it on the person, what's tormenting them? It's God's presence. Because even that icon, that image of God is there. It's, it's not that it's a thing that has some sort of radioactive... It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a means by which God makes his presence, even though he is everywhere present and, and, and filling all things, that there's also some other way that he is specifically present, because that's what I'm asking for. The cross isn't doing the work. God is doing the work. The holy water isn't doing the work. God is doing the work. But he said, use these things. Here's a handkerchief. Use it. I will be present with you. You know, you, you think that the, 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 the handkerchief, go read Tobit and the fish. Tonight, go read Tobit and the fish. Yes? Well, the testing of the demon, the gift, or the training, or any believer has the Holy Spirit in it can do it, or only priest can do it. Testing? Um, casting out demons. Casting out. Which casting, I'm sorry. Interested. Um, I think that it's, it depends upon what you mean by that. Um, can do it only free. from what? I mean, that's, that's the thing is we're talking about there's, there's, there's Thank demonic, you. there's exorcism of objects. No, sorry, there's a, 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 well, yeah, I know. And I'm talking about removing a demon from an object, let's say, for example, the first, the first, the first, the first stage. From a, from a human being, I would say is that it is, it's something that is just done by the priests. Where do you get that from? From my church. But the Bible doesn't. What does the Bible, uh, what does the Bible say? As the gift of the Holy Spirit, when he can then Go ahead and try. No, 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 no. You cannot go try it on your own. You have to have full trust in Jesus Christ and be filled with the Spirit. See, that's the thing is that I think that we can be, we can... Everybody has the Holy Spirit. 
there's a there's a there's a there's a royal priesthood yes but there's also look at look at that there's a there's there's a uh, bish, there's bishops there's bishops there's presbyters there's look at the presbyters the, the role that they have in the uh, in the scriptures there but he was saying the power is not in the priesthood the power is in the office not in the office of priesthood but it's the, the work of Christ just like you said earlier no, no, but he, he denies Christ, that, not he denies that a regular person can do it. Like a, a, a believer, doesn't by the Spirit, can do it. He says only priests. Right, no, I agree. But I say, I'm saying, I'm saying, is a disciplinary, is a, is a disciplinary issue. Is it? Well, I imagine. I, yeah. Uh, one, 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 uh, one point at a time. Um, first of all, I think it's both. Um. Because, for example, the, the training that we have that's out there, okay, Rome has a very formal training system. We don't have a formal training system. There are, some, there are many priests in, in my church who have long, honorable careers, and they never deal with any of this stuff. And then others, for whatever reason, get a lot of it. It's whatever God wants. And I would say I would say no. Why? Because it's up to God. He can give the gift to anyone. Exactly. But I can't say I can't say I can't say one way or the other. I would say in in our system. I I'm saying it. I I'm only speaking for our system because I can't speak for your church. I can't speak for your church. That's what means only your church. I'm saying I'm say, I'm I'm only speaking for because I mean there are there are some churches that are out there like if you go to Southern Baptist they say none of this stuff exists. No, no, personally, you believe that a person outside your system can do system. I don't know. It, it doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter. And I'm I'm and I'm giving you I'm giving you the best answer I can get. It's just I just it doesn't to me it doesn't matter because I'm in I'm doing. I'm talking from my other point of view, so I just want to know do we have the same point or it has to be this way. For me for for me this is this is what's this is what works. But do you accept somebody else? Somebody if I else? if I see it afterwards, I'll I'll when I see it I'll believe it. So you haven't seen it? Um yeah I have. Uh, I, I yes I have. Um in fact I, I've I've seen it um I've seen it up close. I've seen it up close. Other other uh, other people other people out, outside of the Orthodox Church um, doing this. So it, it, it exists. It just it in in the sense, it, 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 what I'm saying is that it, it's no. I wouldn't say anybody. That's that's where, that's where I draw the line. Is no no. Is that God? The, there are some people. There are some people that God. Because, like, for even in our church, for example, you could go to you could go to a monastery. Most of the time, we real severe cases are dealt with in a monastery, and there's a there's a priest and there's there's a bunch of monks and everything else, and they're going to do whatever God leads them. I don't presume. Here's the thing: is that I don't do is I don't say God only operates here and He does not operate there. I will not do that. Okay. So I'm, I, what I'm saying is that is God chooses the, the place and the time and the tools in which, in which that stuff is going to go. So I don't say anybody can do it because that's just not true. Can you I can't. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Can you just say real quick that objects can be, have demons too, not just people? Yes. Like what would be an example of an object? Um, I I was uh, in a house one time and there was a clock and this family had taken a number of pictures in the house and all the pictures that involved this clock had <laughs> it was it was like big ornate thing there were black shadows and things like that that were attached to it in fact um, that's a common thing now in the drug world uh, because there's there's uh, anybody heard of uh, Santa Muerta. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. There, um, in a lot of these things, they will attach, and, and it's a common practice in magic, is to it, uh, attach a demon. To, it's actually easier to to give a demon an object in which he can he can operate through, versus 
um, a person. So, um, like when you're talking about the spitting up of stuff, like in some of those exorcisms and everything else, that's the, the one of the things that will happen sometimes is people are given something that a, de a demon has been attached to, like your food and everything else, and then the exorcism, out that comes. So you're saying those have to be exercised as well, right? Yes. And do you see this in church history and in the Bible too? Um, uh, over specific uh, church history. The fact that it's not a human being, a life form, but it's an inanimate object has to be, has his ability to get a demon on it. Well, um, yeah, when you look at the, the, the scriptures, for example, mention the demons going out to the deserted places. They're attached to a particular location. Um, well, I mean, that's more of a geographical. But I'm talking more of like a, an object more than just a geographical. I think scripturally... Maybe in the Holy Spirit, uh, like I'm, of the Philistines, when the Ark of the Covenant was in front of Dagon, mm -hmm. and it fell over and cut in half and rose. And yeah, that's the... Yeah, that's um, that's more um, on the whole thing about the, there was there was the the order of the Levites who were supposed to be carrying the ark, and when this one guy reached out, disobeyed God, yeah, bang. You see this in church history though, like any of the saints teach this like historically? Oh yeah. The, uh, I mean, you're talking about like the. Probably, probably by the third, fourth century, when you start getting into the desert, the writings of the desert fathers that that have survived. Um, uh, you look at the life of Saint Anthony; it's all about that. I mean, going into these deserted places and and fighting the demons that are there and everything else. It's it's um, uh, fairly early. Yes. Freddie had a guy. He's a Coptic Christian. Anyway, he had a guy that came out here. And I guess you remember the guy that was uh, his parents were. Yep. in etymology and stuff, but he was telling us a story. This kid was saying how his dad heavily in the air of the demonic things that were in the region. His dad was a magician. Magician. Mm -hmm. and stuff. And he would form, uh, he was telling us a story, form wax into a scorpion and then give light and these things walk around. I remember him telling the story. He's kind of a demon here. Yeah, the, the, um, with materializations, um, most of them don't last. If you look at the documentation, they... They have, have the ability to do like a temporary creation, but these things usually don't last. Um, the other thing that they do is they can, demons can often take things, physical things, and, and hide them. Um, I heard of one story where they were doing exorcism on this house, and this, all kinds of stuff disappeared in this house, and big stuff too. And they said finally the day that the demon left, they heard this enormous crash in the dining room, and they came in, and it was like this big pile of stuff. The demons had to give everything back that they had taken, um, uh, but there. But the idea of materializations are usually um, things that will only only exist for a while. They seem to come apart. So I've yeah. seen it. They created a spiral. Well, they've they created a lot of illusion. Yeah, uh, it's not an illusion. It's a new spiral. The, from the demons. Yep. Where Where is this? I, in Egypt. Oh yeah! If you want to, if you want to see some really interesting things, watch the Coptic priests. There's a few yeah. videos of them on YouTube, yeah. and with the with, with the cross and the water and everything else. And what's um, yeah, and they're and they're dealing with the because there's a lot of Muslims who deal with with the um, the jinn, and they think that it's a jinn, but it's actually uh, what they're dealing with is a demon. But I know we have to. Oh, one last thing. I have one final question. Okay. I just want to know your position. Are the 66 books of the Bible the perfect infallible Word of God, or do you have something apart from your church traditions or church? Well, we look at the the books as there's. I guess you get the the. I'm not a biblical scholar. I can't give you the whole thing, but. You know, we look at, like, uh, in the middle of our altar, we have the four Gospels, right? And every day we have a, a lectionary of reading of the Gospel. Then you, then you have the epistles, right? Um, then you have various, um, then you have the, the Old Testament canon of, of the, 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 the Hebrew Old Testament. But we also hold the Greek Old Testament at, at uh, an authoritative level. So, um, but apart from what you consider the 66 books of the Bible, do you 
you have something that you want to come forward with equal authority, or is that the final court of appeal for Warren says this is? It's, um... How are you dividing what's between Genesis and Revelation? Are you talking about the Apocrypha? Well, because we have the apocrypha, we have the we look at the apocrypha as well as 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 books that we that we use in our tradition. Um, they're they're part of they're part of that whole thing. In fact, you know, the apocryphal books are quoted in the New Testament. But then you view so, them with equal authority and inspiration. Why do we? Yeah, I'm not debating. I'm just yeah, no, I'm 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 I'm. We don't use that type of terminology. But you know what I mean. Yes and no. Um, I, with their part of our tradition, and I, I don't know how to express it clearly enough to you. It's 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 a lot more because we have a we have a kind of a different, you know, when you hear the term sola scriptura, right? Okay, which. Um, you know, St. Paul is talking about reading the scriptures at a time when the New Testament didn't exist. So the idea of scripture for us is a lot more a lot more flexible, let's say, than it is. We don't discount any. We don't say this part doesn't count. We had a long discussion. We've decided the Gospel of John doesn't count. We didn't, the, the Orthodox Church never done anything like that. In fact, the reason that you got a canon is from us. Um, um, but the uh, what we look at is the the scriptures as part of the church. It's not that they are authoritative. The ch God is authoritative, okay, and that authoritative that author authority then is vested in the church, and the tr and the and the scriptures are are an inherent part of. The church, we don't separate them as a separate subject. You see why I'm, I'm struggling to answer your question? Because we don't look at the scriptures as something that is, that's utterly divorced from all the rest of things that are in, in the church. Right, but you surely understand the other position. When, when did the church start? I did, that, that, no, I'm asking. No, I'm just, that, I, that, that I won't say. I, I, won't, I, I won't say that I understand the... The, all of the thinking with that, because again, I, 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 I freely admit, I was not raised as a Protestant, I was not raised as a Protestant Christian, and so I don't pretend to know everything. I even went to a Protestant school for a few years, and I found it more confusing than anything, um, because I, I ran into just so many different, because everybody's got their own opinions, okay? And, you know, I ran into, it, like, I have people, for example, that were, let's say, I am absolutely positively, um, I believe 100% in my denomination, um, and I can't tell you what they teach, because I don't know it all, but I wonder, and then there's other people like, I am totally into my denomination, and these are all the things about it that I don't believe, you know. Um, so, you know, I, it's, 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 I don't want to, I don't want to step out and make a conclusive statement about something that somebody else believes. All I can say is what, what our side right. is. That's all I want you to understand. Yeah. Is our, our position is that the scriptures are part of an indivisible whole. And the moment that you start trying to cut them apart, even separating the gospels out and saying, well, this, we're going to deal with that separately. We're going to deal with this chapter separately. And you forget all the rest of the stuff that it's connected to. It's, you're killing it. Because it's an organic whole. Because it's actually part of something that's alive. God. Yes? I, um, two experiences that I've had. Um, okay. I've been serving the Lord for 37 years. And now it's a young girl. Um, I came from a prison ministry where um, our, my pastor was going to prisons and minister the word of God. And um, I got a phone call and it was my sister and I and um, three other sisters in the Lord that, uh, that were church. And there were five of us and others in the ministry. It was a very big ministry, but we got a call and we said, um, it seems like a young boy who's demon possessed and they want prayer warriors. So, um, you want to go? He said, well, let's go. So, we all went to the house and um, you could hear the whole 
racket going on in one room, and um, there was two or three ministers, and uh, you could hear him talk. And um, so we would have praying, um, and the, one of the ministers would come, just keep praying, just keep praying, just keep praying. And um, I, I got a glimpse of him when I went to the room here, and and I saw him, and then went after, 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 of course, the Lord delivered him, and, and, and I saw the boy, he was totally different. Mm -hmm. Is that the boy I saw? That's the same boy. It's a different boy. Just totally different, uh, transformed. And, and then he was very gentle and kind. He said, thank you. Thank you for coming. And um, that was a beautiful day for me. Mm -hmm. uh, because I knew it was, you know, it's, we're in a spiritual, we live in a spiritual world of warfare. So um, then... Uh, there's an experience that I share with you. Um, then I, I, I could see the the transformation of the Holy Spirit transforming a, a, a human being, and how uh, the enemy <laughs> wants to take hold of that person. But anyway, and so now fast forward years later, um, I have five brothers, and two of my brothers went to Vietnam, and one brother one brother came out back okay, but the other brother he um, he's been diagnosed with uh, schizophrenia. And um, one day I was, we were sitting at the table. I, I took care of him one time for almost 10 years. And um, never married, never had any children. And he's really gentle. My brother is very gentle, very kind hearted. And I don't know, will you take that from me over there? And, okay. But this one day uh, we were sitting at the table. And I was making breakfast. And I just sat down and I got my coffee like this. And and he looked at me and he said, I'm going to kill you. And I and I, I looked him straight in the eye, and I, knowing who I am, and cried. I looked him straight in the eye, um, I was cringing, and I said, um, I didn't have time to go ask for help or anything. I looked him straight in the eye, knowing who I am, and cried, and I said, there's nothing you can do against me, and because the Lord, when the Lord decides that he's done with me, and he's finished with me, that's, that's when the Lord will take me. And I don't think he's finished with me yet. And uh, in the name of Jesus, you know, I, and I just prayed over him. And, and I rebuke that spirit in Jesus' name and who I am in Christ and all of his being. Because I am a, Christ is in glory, right? And he says I am one in him. And all of a sudden he just changed. He, he, went, he, he just changed. Because I was able to tell him straight. And the spirit, and I said, Arnold. So where's Barney, my other brother? So who's Barney? He goes, Oh, he's over there in the garage. I said, Okay, Joel, do you want some coffee or something like that? And I said, But it was spiritual, and um, I know beyond shadow that, that that was not God talking to me. I'm going to kill you. No, that was that was a demon who talked talked to me that day. Oh, scary. So thank you. Thank you. George. Sorry, it went long. No, this is awesome. I'm, I'm glad that you actually entertained so many questions. Okay. Yeah, take it, man. It's awesome. When are you coming back? See, they're already asking. <laughs>